Welcome to the Film Riot Podcast. I'm Ryan Conley, and today on the show we have Christo Dimitrov, who is a first assistant director. He's worked on everything from Conan the Barbarian, Expendables 2, 300 Rise of the Empire, Mechanic, Resurrection, Rambo, Last Blood, and most recently he was the first assistant director on Ricky Staub's first written and directed film, Concrete Cowboys, which of course we had Ricky on the show recently. And the role of an assistant director is insanely important. As I say in this episode, I just have so much respect for that role. They really are the ones that keep the wheels turning, that keep the boat above water, keep everybody working and hopefully happy. It's it's just easily one of the most important roles on set, but it's also something that's not really talked about a lot. So if it's something that you want to do, there's not a ton of information out there about that or people talking about what that experience is like. So I was really excited to sit down and talk to him about all that. He was very open, honest, and had a lot of really great things to say. So without further ado, let's jump into it. I would love to know more about you and what gave you your your first gig and and what made you want to do it uh, to begin with. So I started back in Bulgaria. So originally I'm from Bulgaria and it was somewhere, I want to say the year 2000 or 2001, not quite sure about it. I used to work, so back then, this is 20 years ago, so I was 20 or 21 years old, and I was working for an international film festival uh, that is still existing back in Bulgaria, and it's pretty good. And somebody who also working on this film festival told me, do you know there is an American film company, production company that does American movies here in Bulgaria? And we recently interviewed a guy who's the first AD. Back then I had no idea what a first AD means. So we interviewed the first AD who said they need new people, trainees, and uh, if you're interested, you can try it. Because before that, I've mentioned that I want to work something on television. And these guys told me, oh, television sucks. You should <laughs> go and, and make movies. Because back then, this is pre the golden age of TV and yeah. uh, all these amazing things and platforms that we have right now. So this was the time when television was the smaller, uglier sibling wanted to be <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. associated with it. Anyway, uh, so I ended up uh, going to an interview and the interview was, it was one of the <laughs> weirdest experiences I've had because it was not an interview. It was a guy who was explaining to me how unglamorous movie making is and that it's not what people think it is in that it's long hours, hard work, and you're exposed to the elements. Usually, like if it's boiling hot, you're outside. If it's freezing cold, you're also outside yeah. and stuff like that. And then that was about it. And I got a call. I didn't, everybody else who was in the waiting room to get interviewed were people from the National Academy for Film and Theater Arts. I come from a different educational background, uh, nothing to do with film school. I've never been to film school. And they were like, oh, we don't know you. What's your education? And I was like, oh, I'm mastering, like ma trying to get a master's degree in international relations. And they were, oh, uh, so why do you think you can do anything here in the movie industry? We are all uh, future directors, cinematographers. They were quite condescending and rude. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, which didn't help me a lot back then. But anyway, it's um, so I got this call and they said, OK, we want to try trainee. I guess one of the big advantages I had is that back then my English was pretty decent for a Bulgarian living in Bulgaria. Probably this was what actually <laughs> led to this call. And I started as a PA, production assistant. I vividly remember the first day I was on a film set. Nobody explained to me anything about <laughs> the different departments and positions and who's doing what. I had to figure it out on the go. It took some time. It's not rocket science, but imagine getting immersed into something you've never 
experienced before and yeah. it has a, a very clear pronounced structure that everyone takes for granted and knows but you know, so it took me some time i guess it was part of the whole test to see how fast one can actually find out what's going on and figure it out yeah kind of throw you into the deep end situation yeah yeah that was exactly what uh they did i i survived and here i am 20 years later i'm still doing the same thing yeah uh, so so that, that's how i started it was an american company which still exists and it's quite prolific back in bulgaria bulgaria is one of these places in europe where you have a lot of movie making going on uh, a lot of american and european productions some of the big movies that we see here in the states have actually been filmed in bulgaria it's kind of a movie hub and local crews have gotten way way better because this thing has been going for about 20 years now right uh, so it's quite uh, developed and uh, yeah that's that's how I started. And then little by little over the years, I climbed the ladder from a production assistant to cast PA or talent PA, as they call it, second, second AD. I've been a second assistant director for about eight years. And then the last seven or eight years now, I've been first aiding. For those who don't know, could you do a quick like overview of like what, what, what's the job of a PA versus a second, second versus a second versus a first? Well, the PA uh, generally is the other name for a PA is a runner. So you have to run around a lot. Uh, <laughs> good shoes. Yeah, good shoes and really listening to your walkie talkie all the time what's going on. Well, a runner uh, is a PA, you could be helping with the extras, filling in paper or bringing them through the works, meaning costume and makeup, or you can be just bringing coffee to cast and crew members or helping with lock-offs on location. Generally, everything that the AD department or any other department because they are production assistants within each department, almost each department. So these are the trainees, the beginners that do these things to, to help the, let's say, more senior members of the crew. Yeah. Then the next level would be third AD or second, second AD. There are different systems and people call it differently. Generally, this is an assistant director who is working on set, uh, helping the first assistant director and the second assistant director. But the third AD or the second, second AD is always on set and they help with mainly with the background actors. Sometimes might give a hand with actors and uh, lock offs. Also, timing for, for some shots, you need some actors or extras to start later in the shot. So, someone needs to give them a cue, uh, physical or visual. So, these guys might be hiding around the corner, giving a cue when the actor or the extras to step into the frame, go around the corner or whatever. These guys also have obligations during lunch to to keep it orderly and who's having lunch first, who's second, uh, who's the last guy to take crew member to take their lunch and sit down so that they count the whenever, what time the lunch break starts and stuff like that, some administrative uh, functions also on the second and third AD. And then the, the, the second AD runs the base camp. The base camp is where you have all the trailers, all the production vehicles. This is where actors and extras get ready. So the second AD is the master of this field, this area. And uh, also the second AD works, obviously this is the right hand of the first assistant director. And uh, they prepare the call sheet, which is generally what's going to be happening tomorrow. Uh, sometimes they work also on a production report, which is a report what we've done and what we haven't been able to do on this day, uh, on the current day. 
Uh, the second AD is is a position I have a lot of respect for, and it's sometimes I want to say it's underestimated. These guys are doing an amazing job, and a lot of them, a lot of the things they do are probably not seen. But without the second AD, without without a talented second AD who's on top of their craft, every production is doomed to fail. There is a lot of coordination with the different departments about what's going to happen the next day with the cast, uh, with everyone and everything. Also, these are the guys that can spot some issues and things that the first AG wouldn't, wasn't able necessarily to, to, to spot. So they raise the flag and they save the day. Then the first AD takes all the credit for that, but <laughs> it's actually the the second AD very often uh, if he or she is a good second AD that will spot these things. And then you come to the first assistant director. Do you want me to say a couple of words about what the first assistant director does? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Well, generally, this is the person who is responsible for keeping it all running smoothly, getting the work done on time and within budget, minimizing chaos and panic and in a sense of order and predictability throughout the process. There are... Uh, more specifically, probably the main thing that a first assistant director would do once they're given the script and once they get all the information from different departments and mainly the director, the cinematographer and the producers is come up with a schedule. Filling is all about problem solving and um, taking into account all the aspects of filmmaking, create logistical, budgetary, uh, time issues, and whatnot. And then once they come up with the schedule, it, it's a long process, uh, and it's something that has its own life. It, it changes uh, all the time. And once you have the schedule, when you go on set, you kind of oversee the whole process that it all goes according to the schedule and you get director and the cinematographer get their shots. Uh, but also the first AD tries to keep the director and the director of photography within reason, time and budget. Another priority of the first assistant director is to look after the crew and keep them informed and safe. An indispensable part would be communicating to the producers all the key aspects of how the filming goes, what problems uh, we may encounter, and possibly suggest how to address them. And any line of work, being passionate about your job is a huge plus. Sure. Uh, this is regardless of the field. Uh, it's yeah, it's long hours. I, I would say if I have to bring it down to a couple of words, I would say communicator in chief and um, planner who knows enough of both worlds, the, the, the creative field of storytelling and the world of managing people, resources and times. Because this is the position between the director, if this is, like the epitome of the creative side of storytelling and filmmaking and the producers who would represent the whole managerial and financial side of things. Yeah. The, the, the uh, communicator in chief. I love that. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a really good one for go, going back to um, second AD. Is that, is that the role that is most interacting with the talent as far as wrangling them to and from set and all that? Or? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly, that's one part of what they're doing, but it's a very essential part. Uh, it's first communicating in, in pre-production, you communicate as a second AD with the agents, and uh, then you have to set up all these costume fittings, makeup tests, sometimes there are stunt rehearsals, and whatnot, depending on what kind of project this is. Uh, sometimes there are like table reads or read throughs. And uh, the second AD is the one who's communicating all these things to the talent. And, and then 
on the day when we were shooting, yes, definitely wrangling them in the morning, going through the works. It's it's a whole other universe scheduling and running things and getting uh, people into costume and wardrobe. And again, we are talking about actors. I love actors and I have a lot of respect for for them and it's not an easy job though it's glamorous and fun it is for some of these guys it's glamorous and fun but not (laughs) necessarily for all of them it is a hard job and actors are without this sounding rude i believe in some cases you need to treat them the way you treat your kids with a lot of trust and respect but also you don't want them to get unhappy and <laughs> upset because then the whole process gets can can slow down and right. um, yeah it, i'm not saying it's all about actors it's not movie making is it's a synergy of a lot of things but obviously actors are the ones who are on the screen this is how we when when you watch a movie, it's it's the story and the actors. Everything else is even directing. It, it's not. I, I mean, it's great to have great director and great script and uh, costume design and sound design and editing and all these things matter greatly. But if we have to single out a few things, that would be the script, the story, and the actors, they're acting. So you want to make sure your actors are happy and they have the time and resources and the conditions to do their thing. Uh, The second AD does a lot for that. Uh, So does the first AD on set. Yeah, and after... After you've picked a project, you've decided that you're you're doing this thing, um, it's happening. What would be as a first AD? What would be your next step at that point? Like this project's happening, you're attached. Now, what would be your first thing to do? Uh, obviously, after reading the script, break it down. The first step is to break down the script. Uh, there is a bunch of softwares that you can use, but I think still the most popular one is Movie Magic. It's not. It's not something like it's not this type of software where you upload the script and you get the breakdown. Uh, there is a lot of <laughs> manual and like you have to put uh, some thought into it. Uh, artificial intelligence has not been this advanced yet to to do this type of job. Yeah, probably it's gonna happen in the near future. But there are a lot of things that are in the script that cannot be automatically transferred uh, into movie magic. The thing is to break down the script, which is scene by scene. You go and you break it down into all the elements uh, that, like, this would be the characters, the background, actors, uh, stunts, costumes, makeup, production design, animals, special effects, visual effects, whatever is on the page and whatever you think uh, you would need in order to make this scene happen. So you get all these elements uh, into these strips uh, and you go scene by scene. Then the next thing would be coming up with a schedule. You need to put all these scenes into a specific order, into a particular number of shooting days. And uh, here you have to apply all your experience, intuition, (laughs) everything you've learned. (laughs) And it's very different for every project and every script. Sure. And when you're building out that schedule, is is it very experience based? Like I've I've always really want because I I love all of you eighties. Like the stuff that you guys can do blows my mind. I I direct, and I'm always like, how did you even foresee that happening? It's it's incredible. So I'm always wondering, is it just the experience of you know you coming from the PA and up through that AD department to have seen so much to where you just almost gut instinct know what's going to take? Is there something more teachable there or is it really just the experience of it? Well, I think I I would say it's a mix of both. I remember clearly the very first time when I had to build a schedule as a first city and I was scared to death. I could not imagine how I can 
do that. And I was pretty sure I'm going to get it totally wrong. But then you have to, so generally you need to be urban. You need to, uh, you, you cannot, you cannot make a schedule without having done some movie set before that. Ideally, uh, ideally this is within the AD department because then you see how different departments function and how much time it takes for uh, different departments to achieve particular uh, things they have to achieve. So you need to have a very specific idea of how a movie set works before yeah. you're able to build a schedule. And then I would say analytical and logical thinking helps a lot. Experience, definitely. And the other thing that actually is the most helpful, and I didn't know that at the beginning, is you need the input of your head of departments. Because if your approach is, I know everything, I'm the first AD, then you're going to get it wrong. You're going to have a lot of mistakes. <laughs> the approach should be, and this is what my experience has confirmed over the years, all the head of departments, they know their jobs way better than you do. So ask them. Generally, you build a schedule the way you think it should be. And then you have these meetings, these discussions from head of departments, because sometimes they give you the key. Uh, oh, no, this is how we're going to achieve that. And it's going to take two hours. It's not going to take five hours or whatever. You just need the experts to weigh in. So that's how it works. So it's a combination. Scheduling is a combination of experience, being observant, being a good listener, and having a knack for problem solving and analytical thought. Also, if you're interested in directing, but also not trying to be a director. This helps a lot. What I mean is it's good to know. I mean, every director has their unique approach to, to the material, to the script. So trying to figure out their vision and what they want to do with the script without trying to step in their shoes, this helps a lot. Understanding what they want to achieve visually and in terms of storytelling. This helps you a lot when you're building the schedule. This gives you the idea, oh, okay, here I've given half a day for this scene. No, this is not what we need. We need probably a whole day and the other way around. So it's trying to understand what people are trying to achieve. Not only the director, the cinematographer. The cinematographer is someone who can make or break your schedule, actually, because once you start shooting, the cinematographer is the one who needs time to light the scene, to, to light this close-up of the actor. And if you haven't had your discussions in advance and if you have no idea what their approach and way of working, you can get in a very way the first AD because you need to allow the time the cinematographer needs. Uh, also, over time, you develop these mechanisms where if they're taking too long, you step in and you're like, okay, we really need to pick up the pace and we need to start shooting now. But then there is a lot of also <laughs> psychology and diplomacy, I want to say. Yeah. It, it's the first AD has a very political job. Also, it has a lot to do with making people deliver within certain time limits, which is always hard. Yeah, so so back to your question. Yeah, I think I answered your question. It's a mix of a certain type of thinking plus experience plus uh, being able to listen what people are saying. Yeah. And when, when does that conversation, because you were mentioning how, you know, understanding what the director is trying to do with the film is very important to, you know, scheduling and, and being able to build all that out. When does that conversation happen? Does that happen before you're building the schedule or does it happen like sort of in tandem to that? And, and what's your process of really trying to dive into the mind of the director to really 
figure out what exactly their vision is for the piece? Well, usually, usually I build a schedule because you have the basics. Like you have, let's say, 30 or 50 or 20 shoot days. So you have to fit it within these days. So I build a schedule based on the script and my experience and how I see things uh, and all the, the whole logistical aspect of it. And then once I have the schedule, I, I try to come up with a schedule as, so before you start shooting a movie, you need prep. Prep is very essential. And for the first day, generally the rule is if it's 10 weeks of shooting, it's 10 weeks of prep. This might vary, but this is roughly the rule. So I'm usually trying in my first week of prep to already have a schedule that we can use as a basis. Of course, this is something that evolves and changes all the time. And sometime by the time you start shooting, it's drastically changed from it what it was at the beginning. But anyway, I come up with a schedule and then during this prep time, you have these meetings with the director uh, and with all head of departments going over different aspects of the script, different scenes and sequences. You have also another time where you get a lot about how people are thinking to achieve a particular, to shoot a particular sequence or scene is when you're scouting the locations. When you are talking about equipment that you're going to use. These are different steps, different meetings that you go through. And this is how you get your information. Also, if I, if I have a question, I just go directly to the director <laughs> and ask them their question. Uh, let, let's say the first AD has, it's just the position itself, it has the privilege to bother the director and ask them questions all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes you ask questions about things that the director still hasn't had the chance to, to think about, uh, which is totally okay. And then this whole experience working with a particular director, it, it's, it's all about trust, developing this mutual trust. Sometimes you click with a director the very first time you meet them or you talk to them. Sometimes it's a more painful journey. Right. Yeah, sometimes you realize that you're alone and you do what you can do. It's all about teamwork. Yeah. Movie making is a team effort. Sometimes it's not that easy to get under somebody's skin or to win their trust. Usually, I don't want to be judgmental, but usually the hardest part comes when you have a director or cinematographer or any head of department who is very sure about what they're doing. And this makes them kind of secretive about what they want to do. But if you're secretive about what you want to achieve, you just don't get it because you need a lot of people to facilitate and make your vision come true. Yeah. So, but, but I've seen different <laughs> approaches and it, it, it's actually all about personality, but you cannot change people's personality within, you can, you can try and give them a hand. Sometimes they take the hand, sometimes they don't. I'm not trying to paint a picture of the first idea of the, as the savior or something like this. Sure. <laughs> but I'm always, my personal approach is to, to establish a really close working relationship with this team that you are working. That's, that's the only way you can make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, I, I definitely, I mean, you don't want to say, but I'll say it. I, I, you know, the first AD in my experience has always been the person that keeps the boat afloat. Like the, the hardest productions I've ever had is when I had a first AD that wasn't up to the task because maybe they were newer or we just flat out didn't have one because it was that small of a production. Those have always been the worst and the best, uh, most amazing productions I've ever had with the least amount of, there's always an intense amount of stress, but the least amount of stress where I felt like I could focus on telling the story uh, was when I had a really good AD, which is why I wanted to talk to you about all this. And I, I love what you had to say about, you know, some departments that it's a, it's maybe like an insecurity of why 
they kind of become secretive about the things that they do. Cause I've seen that happen. And I think, you know, back of years past, I've been somebody who did that sort of thing. So that's a really good thing for creatives to keep in mind of, you know, being able to communicate. And if there is an insecurity bursting past that insecurity to communicate, because it's what's best for the production and gives you the ammunition you need to do your job. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with you because at the end of the day, it all comes down to people's skills on the side of the first aid because of course expertise and experience are necessary conditions but working with people is the most difficult and most rewarding part of my job and shooting a movie is like creating a parallel reality and along the way you meet very different personalities you have to understand to collaborate with and in a way live with it's why the big family they are members of your big family that you're not particularly fond of, right. but you have to live with them. It's, you cannot give them the like cancel button or something. They, they are there and you have to deal with them, with them. So better make them feel they're part of the team. And uh, I think that's way smarter than putting people down, putting them in the corner and uh, like saying, oh, you're not good at what you're doing. Yeah. Because you, the only thing that this brings is pain yeah. <laughs> on the part of this person. And then this might turn into, I don't know, conscious or subconscious. I've seen that uh, conscious or subconscious willingness to, to sabotage the process. Like there are all kinds of people. Of course, there are boundaries. Of course, sometimes you have to, I think this person needs to, leave now to be let go now but usually you don't have to go this far just people need to be appreciated and uh, usually even the most inexperienced and insecure person can contribute as long as you show some faith in them yeah it's easier said it's easier said than done it's easy now for me to give you all these theories because i'm uh, (laughs) obviously my position is such that all, all filmmaking has stopped now worldwide. I was in the middle of a project and we got suspended. Yeah. <laughs> so we are just staying at home, watching movies, reading and thinking about the future of our industry, especially physical production. How is this going to be from now on? Are we going to be able to gain an actor with a crew of 200 people around them? Or is it going to be something different? Or it, Anyway, that's a different topic. But yeah, generally, first aid is, and everyone should try to empower people on a film set versus put them down. And because there, there, is, this also, there is also this idea that the first aid is someone who's shouting at people <laughs> yeah. and putting them down when they don't deliver as expected or don't deliver within time. And I don't believe in this approach and I don't practice it. The other approach is I mentioned to try and to empower people and to keep your voice down because if you're the shouting type, at some point people get used to it and they are, oh, uh, okay, she or he, they shout all the time, uh, whatever. So that's that's not a good way of approaching things. But yeah, there is this concept of the screaming first AD, yeah. rude, sarcastic, sassy first AD. I'm trying not to fit this mode. I, I, I don't like this and I don't think it's effective at all. And also things have been changing a lot over the last couple of years. And the bullying style is definitely not something that's encouraged, just the opposite. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that, too, because that's how I always like to keep my sets as well. It's like the more it's like you said, it's it's a team, it's a family. The more that that's able to be nurtured and it feels like a safe place. I've, I've noticed the the projects are always so much better, even just in the end, the film as a whole, everything shines a lot better. But an- another question I had was with that scheduling, you've built the schedule and of course things always go wrong in production or a way you didn't think. Do you have like a specific method to adjusting on the fly? You you have your schedule in hand, but now things are shifting and you have to, you know, stay flexible. So what, yeah. what's sort of your process there? Well, my process, um, let's say a couple of years ago, what I was trying to do, I'm building a schedule and then I am 
oh, here this thing can go wrong, and here this might go wrong, and here the weather might be really bad and we wouldn't be able. And you start building, this is plan B in case this happens. This is plan B. and But then you start getting bogged down into plan Z and whatnot. And, and you're just creating a narrative in your head of how things might go wrong and what you're going to do. So it's actually not effective. So what I am trying to do now is yeah i'm i'm always trying to have a plan b but you never know one thing you never know on a film set is where is the curveball gonna gonna come from right. usually you think it's gonna be the weather and then it turns out that the action vehicle that was supposed to be there at 9 a.m. is not there for some reason so you never know what's gonna happen and you cannot live under the constant stress of anticipating what's going to go wrong. My approach is keep the channels open. If something is going wrong or if somebody starts seeing that we might not get something or something might go wrong, just come and talk to us, talk to me so that we figure it out in advance. And, and then I come up with some kind of plan, but I definitely want whoever is mostly involved, the stunt coordinator, the, the DP or whoever, to also tell me what they think about it. So then the bunch of us come up with a new plan. Sometimes you have to be more assertive because you don't have the time to have everyone put their heads together and think about a plan. So you go... I don't know. I think with, with years, it's becoming a combination of your experience, gut reaction, your instincts, and what you think you should be done. Sometimes it comes down to just, okay, because everything we do is so time sensitive. It's like, okay, here's what we're doing. And someone says, probably it's not the best. Yeah, it might not be the best plan, but we don't have to, the time to come up with a second best plan or something better. So let's go with that. Sometimes you have to do that because people need direction. If people see that there is a bunch of guys that are trying to figure it out and they cannot and changing their mind, it, it gets a bit messy, it gets a bit sloppy. So there is always a solution. I guess my, <laughs> my only advice would be try to keep calm, breathe in, breathe out, think clearly and you come up with a plan. Just don't put all the pressure on yourself. Oh, it's up to me now to save the production. Don't do that. But try to think clearly and logically. And this is how you're going to get the solve to the problem. A lot of the pressure comes from, as I said, the fact that you don't have time. You have to think on your feet. You have to come up with it within the next two minutes. Yeah. This puts a lot of pressure. It sounds like there's no way around experience. The The main function there is just the experience that you built over the years. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it. Now that you say it, you sound like it. But I've done this also before I had a lot of experience. So it's instinct. It, it's right. an instinct. And, and it's, not, it's, not, it's not rocket science. And you learn, you know, there is a certain way of, thinking when it comes to being smart and inventive on a movie set in order to get what you need to get and to get it fast and cheap and good it's impossible to have the three at the same time but anyway and you start picking this way of thinking up you start picking it up from other more experienced members of of the crew it's just the thing that, so again, it comes with experience, with being exposed to uh, different types of problems and issues. Well, some people are, some people are, let's say, some people are genius about it. They start doing it from the very beginning. This was not the case with me. I just picked it up and I don't have the confidence that I have a solution for any problem, yeah. but I have the confidence that I can keep my calm come up with a plan and quickly talk it through with the other people that are in charge. Yeah. And we take an informed decision. And also it's, well, the other thing that makes making these decisions easier is being ready to take the responsibility. I'm not, this is one of the things I've learned. I'm not afraid to 
be accountable for a decision I've taken or to to be responsible for what I've done, especially in the cases when I was wrong or my plan was not perfect. But probably in this particular moment, we couldn't come up with a better plan. And I'm always trying to focus more on the future, like the present, what's going on right now and what we're going to do next, not on why did it all go up in smoke yesterday? What was wrong? Why did things go south? Whose fault was it? Right. This doesn't help a lot. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And what about your relationship with the director? What it, What would you say is a really good and functional relationship with the director on a film? And are there any experiences that you have that were like, yeah, directors should do this and directors shouldn't do that when working with their AD? Huh. I don't think anyone has asked me this question before <laughs> what di- directors should do usually it's what first aid should do and shouldn't do with it well it's so i love working with directors that are well prepared that yeah. go into details and that are meticulous about what they're doing are meticulous in their prep i love directors that care about their crew and cast this is one thing I, I don't take kindly when there are directors that treat their talent and their crew as expendable. Yeah. This is bad and it doesn't help them at all. Then from my experience lately, because I think movie making became way more decentralized and like way more democratic, way more people can direct now. Just because of all the platforms, it's not that closed industry anymore. It's still very difficult to break in, I guess. But there is way more going on. There are way more platforms, so way more people can try. Because lately I've worked with a lot of first actors, and I've been very impressed how well prepared and how well acquainted with the craft these guys are. Yeah, which is amazing, and and then they also come with this humility, which I think is is great and helps a lot the whole process and the end product. This approach of we are all in this together. This is how I wanted to. This is how I see it. This is how I wanted to work. But you guys tell me how to do it because you know probably better how to achieve that. So uh, well-prepared directors, uh, not too full of themselves. <laughs> These are the kind of people I strike really great working relationship with. And as I mentioned, trusting each other, this gives a lot yeah. uh, to everyone. Yeah, totally agree, man. Like trust is trust is key with uh, yeah. you know, all of yeah. your collaborators. It's, it's just such a personal and passionate job to have on on all fronts when you're making the thing i mean it's it is such a hard thing to do to uh to create a film of any kind that it's just everybody is just there because of how passionate they are so it's it's definitely an interesting dynamic uh across the board i do to uh kind of head toward the end of this thing i do want to jump to some questions that were given to me wannabe uh uh, assistant directors actually. Uh, oh, yeah, you. sure. So the first one is what would you say is the best path to start you off on your journey to becoming a first AD? Uh, well, probably the best path is <laughs> the path I've taken. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, this is because what I've been exposed to, and I think it really works. The best path is to start as a PA within the AD department as an AD, because this is how you see what people within the AD department, the different positions, the different levels are doing. This is how you get to understand how the whole thing works. And it also gives you a pretty good perspective on what every other department is doing. So this is the thing. I I think this is the best way And also keep an open mind and listen, listen, listen. And uh, yeah, that that I I think this is the best way to climb up the ladder of the AD world. That's great. Uh, I think that's the best way. I don't I I don't think I've ever seen a first AD who just became a first AD before doing any other AD 
right. work or any other department. No, I, no I don't, skipping I'm the trying, line. <laughs> no, not skipping the line. Producers, as funny as it might be, producers can't skip the line. A lot of them become producers without being that involved. Just let's say they've been assistants to a producer, which means they they see a lot and they yeah. they learn the craft by assisting a producer. But they don't have to necessarily go to for for a first AD. I but generally also it's my personality. I believe in taking the time to learn the craft in yeah. any line of work. I don't believe in jumping to to the next level without knowing enough of the level at which you are. Yeah, man. Got to put in those uh, 10,000 hours. Yep. 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 Well, that, that's totally true. That's totally true. Yep. 10,000 hours. Uh, but uh, moving on next, next question is who handles directing background talent? Oh, it, so it depends what kind of, uh, what kind of director you have, you can't, what kind of project and how big of a project it is. So, there is i'll try to differentiate a couple of types you you can have so sometimes there are directors that are very specific about their background action so they are in charge of it they direct the background actors sometimes it's the first ad who directs the the whole background action and i love doing it i've done it for many years and i still do it unless i'm on a project where I don't know, you have 500 people that are moving along five streets and you're on a car and going around. Then you have a bunch of other guys that actually do the, the whole thing for you. And then, so might be the director, which is a rare thing, the first AD, and very often it's the, the second, second AD or the third AD. They're in charge of directing the extras and then just the first AD and the director will give them notes after this take uh make sure the guy in the white beard we don't see him anymore because we've established him so well or stuff like that or the lady over there is laughing and everyone else is crying she should be crying if she cannot cry take her over there in the corner where we don't see her very much and stuff like that on, on big big productions it's the second second assistant director sometimes they have a person who's called crowd marshal that that's more the european system so this is someone who works just with the extras it, it's it's different on different sets <laughs> right when it's uh your your role as the first ad to handle the background actors it, do you have a process for that a method that you've created over time anything that you've kind of learned from that to really make a realistic sort of background yes definitely explain i always go in front of them and i explain to them what is the story what is this particular scene about and what depending on the scene but what what what's going on there emotionally what's going on there in terms of blocking who's where so that they're aware what it's all about and then they feel they are part of it, not just somebody who was brought to do something and go away. They are part of the whole process and then they deliver uh, way, way better. And, and then I'll give them, if it's so about, it depends. If you have 10 people uh, and you, get, you give them specific things that they need to do, it's one thing. Sometimes you have 500 people and I would ask them after explaining what the whole thing is, sometimes I would give them the freedom to improvise. And after the first take, I would make small adjustments. But I treat them as actors. And I, I treat them as actors. As sometimes the first take will explain to the actor, well, it, it, some directors would, would do that or tell them this, tell them that, just pass them a note. Or sometimes you explain to them, this is the scene, this is what we're doing, and, and then they go for a rehearsal. I also, if I have the time, I would also run a rehearsal or two with the background, especially if it's big scenes where long scenes where people are moving and there is a certain choreography. Great. And uh, the next question is how to handle trouble on set. Like if, you know, maybe two people are butting heads or you're having more of a difficult person, is, is there a specific way in to sort of be diplomatic about that? Well, yeah, I'm trying to be diplomatic with people. If I see that, people are bumping heads, I would try to 
ask them not to do it on set, to take it somewhere else and figure out. Because not necessarily when people bump heads, sometimes the last thing they need is someone to interfere and be the judge of it. So it's, it, it, it just depends. But overall, if you, it, it's also personality. Sometimes you, you notice that there are people that are more well, aggressive, though this is a strong word, but more emotional and just let them be as long as they don't hurt anyone. And yeah, generally I'm trying to figure out if they need someone to step in and help them or they'd rather take it between themselves and figure it out, but always have the calm approach and try to soothe things to calm them down and put some sense into it rather than, I don't know, escalate things by taking sides and stuff like that. Yeah. And the last question is, uh, is joining the DGA necessary? Well, that's a very good question. Right now, I'm not DGA. And I come to realize that I'm in a niche where (laughs) there is a lot of work for me. And I don't mean really, really small, low, low budget films. I mean, there is this niche of (laughs) <laughs> really decent budget movies that are non-DGA and they need non-DGA first ADs that are experienced enough uh, to do them. So I fit this <laughs> description. So I'm, I cannot, I've never been DGA, so I cannot say, well, definitely it's way better. There are definitely some upsides uh, about being DGA. And also I know at some point DGA, but not being DGA does not mean you are not good at what you're doing and you don't have enough experience and you are not professional enough. This is definitely not uh, the case. I'm saying it out loud because a couple of times I've had this attitude, oh, are you DGA? And I'm like, no, I'm not DGA. Well, then there's no point of uh, talking to you at all. So, uh, which is a bit extreme of an attitude to non-DGA uh, 80s. Yeah. So that's great. That That's really interesting. So you haven't found the need to join the DGA yet, and you're working on some pretty massive things still. Uh, yeah, but don't forget that I'm someone who came to this country six, seven years ago, and I started working here three years ago. Before that, I was working only in Europe big American project, but in Europe. So I have, and, and, and then here it started picking up and I'm getting jobs on bigger and bigger projects. Bigger doesn't necessarily mean better, but right. it's bigger in terms of scope and budget and everything. But yeah, I, I, it's not like I just because back in Europe, in order to do big stuff, you don't need to be DGA. That's the thing. I guess, if I started my career here in the United States 20 years ago, if by now I was not a DJ, this would have been a bit weird, probably. <laughs> right, right. All right. Well, great, man. I uh, really appreciate you uh, taking the time and, and uh, imparting all your knowledge to us. Oh, my, my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. And I love your podcast and your site and blog and everything. Excellent. So, Thanks so much, man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for today. Again, a big thank you to Juristo for taking the time to chat with us about all of that. You can jump over to filmride.com forward slash podcast to find the episode page for this episode to find more from him. And of course, you can find me online at twitter.com forward slash Ryan underscore Conley. If you did dig this episode, jump over to iTunes, leave a review, subscribe. That always helps us out. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. Repeat.